book called Heroic Leadership. And uh, bundled under my arm, I took it home and I sat on my bed and I started reading it and I started getting tingles through my spine because I'd been out doing leadership work in the corporate world some years before and in front of me I had an articulated, a beautifully articulated model of exactly what I'd been out talking about, sort of as Pamela Webb Incorporated. And so I found it really, uh, it was kind of an exciting moment. And I think, I suspect somewhere deep in my bones, I dreamed that maybe something might happen with me and leadership here. And uh, surely down the track it actually has, you know, a couple of years later. Um, I'm someone who unashamedly has a plumbed into this tradition. I was going to say plumbed the depths, but I think that would take several lifetimes. And I found it unbelievably interesting, unbelievably evocative, and I found the spirituality that underlies it personally profound and actually, truthfully, really transformational. So um, I've actually gone off and I'm studying it. Um, so, you know, that's something for somebody who didn't know very much about it in the beginning. Um, I feel like it's got a huge amount to offer in our work of just leadership out in the corporate world. There's a world really hungry for depth, even if they don't want all the stuff that uh, goes with actually having depth, but there's definitely great interest in depth. Um, but one of the things we started to say, like Patricia said, is well, we're doing it out here, what does it mean inside? And we started to say, what would it mean to actually have an organisation here with, I don't know how many people we've got now, 150? An organisation full of leaders, that's a pretty exciting and compelling concept and I think we're just at the beginning of thinking about what that might mean and thinking about how we might go about forming ourselves in that way. So, as Patricia said, no better person to talk to us about that and inspire us than uh, Christopher Lowney. So it's uh, personally quite exciting and a monumental moment. Um, I've got some um, bio words on Christopher here. So now we get the official. Can I call you this? <laughs> so Chris was a Jesuit seminarian for seven years before leaving to join the corporate world where he spent 17 years in a leading global financial services company called J.P. Morgan. He became a managing director in this organisation and he was still in his 30s and ended up holding senior positions across the, the world in a range of cities. I think it's Tokyo and Singapore and London and New York. You know, he's an accomplished man. Um, he's a graduate of Fordham University, which is a Jesuit university in New York, and uh, he graduated with all the kind of flying colours that I don't even know how to pronounce. Um, and he received his MA, and he has honorary doctoral degrees from St. Louis University, Marymount Manhattan University, and the University of the Great Falls. Um, he wrote his first book, which was a global success, Heroic Leadership, Best Practices from a 450-year-old company that changed the world. Wrote a second book, which um, I must admit I haven't read, A Vanished World, Medieval Spain's Golden Age of Enlightenment. That'll be a read sometime down the track. And a third book entitled Heroic Living. And this book is incredibly compelling and incredibly interesting for all of us who are you know, committed to developing ourselves further uh, as, as leaders and as you know, good, focused, contributing human beings. And it presents what I think is a pretty enormous uh, challenge to us all. And this is what Christopher says in this book. By transforming ourselves into who we should be, we can lead our civilization towards what it should be. Not a small, spirited, self-absorbed humanity, but a great, spirited civilization that loves life, other people, and the world. The time for the civilization of self is over. Let's start building the civilization of love. So let's have a conversation with Chris and see what we learn about how to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> so Chris, um, I'm going to get you to speak to the audience when I speak to you rather than just talk to me in conversation because it's really, it's really about them uh, rather than about us. So um, and we have a little issue with our mics because um, 
when I, I have to turn mine off and you have to turn yours on. So we'll have to see how sharp we are in doing that. Now, what I wanted to start with is to say, when I read your books, personally I get really quite excited. And I think that that's because you're a person who's really, really excited about a subject. You're really excited about what this Jesuit tradition has got to offer the world. I think I'd like to start by asking a little bit of your personal journey, how you actually came to write heroic leadership and heroic living. And it looks to me like in itself it's a bit of a heroic undertaking. Okay, does it work? Oh, it works fine, yeah. Um, so, um, I guess the, the first thing I'd like to do is thank people for uh, showing up. Everybody's busy and uh, I'm sure people have a lot of work today and it's a sacrifice to come, so that's the first thing I want to say. And uh, the second thing I'd, I'd like to say is thank you for saying all those kind and generous things, but I have to tell you the reality is nothing <laughs> as good. So I sort of much, you know, in, in J.P. Morgan life, we always used to say, look, what you have to do is under-promise and over-deliver. You know, set the expectation low enough that everybody thinks you're really terrific when you do better than that. And um, unfortunately, it kind of did the opposite, which is set the expectation higher than I'm going to deliver. But, you know, that's life. We always get disappointed. Um, so uh, now, in answer to your question, so you um, heard from the introduction, I was a Jesuit. Uh, I, I went to a Jesuit high school. Um, I think we have here a Xavier, right, uh, Jesuit High School, and um, so I went to a Jesuit high school in New York, and uh, then after high school I joined the Jesuits, so I was a seminarian, 18 years old until about 24, and then somewhere along the line there I figured out what celibacy was going to be like. Um, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, what, so while, I, you know, I, I joined the Jesuits when I was very young and, uh, you know, in, in the course of my time in the seminary, I, I understood uh, that, okay, look, my path in life is not going to be as a, my path as a Christian and in life is not going to be as a priest, but uh, working in the world. And so then I worked uh, at J.P. Morgan, the investment bank, for a number of years. Um, and then I uh, decided to leave uh, Morgan about uh, 2000. <coughs> Um, 2000, two, uh, more, more or less. And um, so why did I leave Morgan? You know, all kinds of reasons. Probably some reasons people would admire and some reasons people would say, oh geez, you know, that's uh, kind of craven. You know, like frankly, if I thought I was going to be chairman of J.P. Morgan, I probably would have stuck around for a few more years. You know, so part of life is you sort of understand, well, where's my trajectory here and where am I going? And you know, another aspect of it is I think people liked me at Morgan and thought I did a good job. But, you know, you work in these big companies, you also, you also have a very strong feeling that, you know, if I keel over here and die at my desk, people are going to feel bad for a day and then they're going to drag me out and someone else will come in and do my job, you know. So you realize, uh, okay, look, you know, I'm just one of 25,000 schleps here and that's the start and end of it. And so you feel, okay, look, I, it, you know, maybe there's something more to life than just doing this. I didn't want to be 70 years old and feel like the only thing I could say about my life is I work in J.P. Morgan, you know? Uh, and so then for any number of reasons, like those and others, I said, okay, I want to uh, spend more time doing uh, what we might, uh, the kind of work you all do, uh, charitable, uh, 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 justice related, more, more directly, uh, service of others than the service of self, okay? And then I also felt it might be interesting uh, to do some writing. Um, I, uh, I had this idea about writing a leadership book, and why was that? Maybe because it was a cheaper way of trying to figure out my own life than going into therapy, you know, because I was a seminarian and then I worked in a bank. Um, but in a way, what the book tried to do was, was take stories from the early, think about the Jesuits from not exactly a corporate perspective, but at least from an organizational perspective. You know, like if, if we abstract ourselves from a second, for a second from the fact that these uh, were and are priests and, uh, and understand themselves as doing a religious mission, by any objective standard, they were and are an enormously successful organization. You know, uh, for starters, 
they've lasted 500 years, very, very few. In, in the United States, for example, of, of, the, of the 100 largest companies 100 years ago, you follow that so far? Only 19 of them still exist. So even to have some uh, durability says something in the world, you know, not to mention uh, some of the uh, claims that Jesuits could make about what they accomplished. You know, some of you know that uh, the Vietnamese alphabet was developed with the help of the Jesuit, and the world, one of the world's largest cities, Sao Paulo, was co-founded by a Jesuit. So, you know, they've ended up in all kinds of things. And my thought was, could I try to translate uh, for people like uh, for people like us, but also more so for people working in corporations, could I try to translate ideas, values, approaches that for them would have very deep religious and Catholic roots? Could I try to translate those into language that would be meaningful for people in all kinds of environments? So when I worked at J.P. Morgan, okay, look, there's some Catholics there. But there are Christians of other stripes, there are lapsed Christians, there are atheists, Muslims, Jews. And my thought was, could I translate uh, some of the Jesuit values into language that would be meaningful to people of any uh, tradition, you know, that would be meaningful, whatever is their tradition. So a Catholic could uh, read it and, and process it in a religious way, but somebody who is uh, a humanist with no religious tradition at all could say, okay, I can relate to these values, and I guess we're going to at some time talk more specifically about what some of those are. So that's why I wrote the book, and that's a little bit of my story. Thank you. And you started to allude to some of the achievements of the Jesuits. There have been lots of people here who wouldn't understand very much about the extraordinary achievements of this small group of men you know, who set out in the 16th century and created this, as you call it, company that changed the world. Tell us about some of those historical achievements that, you, that have really awed you, Chris. Um, okay, so um, I guess what most uh, interested and drew me um, Is, so, you know, I'm working in J.P. Morgan, you work in a big company, and big companies nowadays, you know, I, I, I mean, the environment occasionally is invigorating, but often it's pretty discouraging, you know, I mean, they're very political places, they're very bureaucratic, it's really hard to get anything done, you're spending all your time in meetings, you know, it's kind of soul-deadening in a way, a lot of times, you know? Um, and. I used to think sometimes of these stories of the early Jesuits. The, early, the Jesuits were started in the, um, in the 1500s, and remember the age of exploration was really unfolding at that time. Uh, of course, there were, um, uh, there were very accomplished civilizations all over the globe, but as far as Europeans were concerned, they were just beginning to come in contact uh, with these civilizations, and often in a very... Um, uh, brutal and condescending uh, ways, right, in, in the first Europeans to come to Latin America and Asia and so on. And instead you had these really interesting stories of these uh, Jesuits, you know, guys who, um, uh, for example, uh, one, there's one great story, this guy Roberto de Nobili, who's a priest, and he goes to India, and, um, you know, he's kind of walking around there in a hundred degree heat in this big black cassock and uh, you know, uh, the, the way, and Indians would have thought of these people as if they were from outer space, as of course they would have seemed, you know? And eventually he said, look, I mean, the only way um, we're going to be able to share what we think is, uh, we, we we're bringing of some value is by meeting these people a little bit where they are, you know? So he uh, spent time uh, reading uh, Hindu uh, scriptures and learning uh, uh, Hindi and actually changed his dress from a black cassock to, uh, you know, what would be more recognizable as, uh, as a religious person's dress in India and so on. Now, you know, the, of course, the great challenge is, uh, okay, there are things that I deeply believe to be true, so how can I kind of hang on to what I believe, yet at the same time uh, try to uh, honor and uh, find uh, the truth and goodness in someone else's tradition and make that bridge. And to me, you know, to kind of 
uh, have the mindset to try that in the 16th century or these early early 1600s, 17th century. I mean, it's just phenomenal, you know. I mean, nowadays we really don't pull that off very well, and I think a lot. I suspect a lot of, in different ways, what folks are doing here is in maybe analogous to doing that kind of work, you know, where we feel like we have something to bring to the table, but we also want to honor the situations people are in and what they have to say. So, you know, the kind of imagination, um, the courage, the uh, adaptability, the willingness to try things, the willingness to take risks, the willingness to fail, um, the, the, uh, the, the kind of being deeply motivated by, some, by your own religious or humanistic beliefs, all of those things struck me as, as really um, uh, one invigorating but also very valuable for people uh, in all organizations and walks of life. And they spread across, they spread across the world, sorry, they spread across the world pretty rapidly, didn't they? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to practice our coordination well here, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously they were Euro the first groups of Europeans, and within one generation there were Jesuits working in five uh, continents, not Australia. <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so they spread uh, very rapidly and grew very rapidly. I mean, the, there were 10 of them and uh, within 30 years, I think there were 5,000. So it was kind of a remarkably electric growth story across Europe. Chris, um, we work in a Jesuit organization, but there would be a lot of us here who don't really understand much about what characterizes the Jesuit way of leadership. And you've you know, hinted at it just there. One of the things I was interested in your book is that you said the Jesuits don't have much to say about what leaders do or what they achieve, and there are plenty of people who've written about that, but a lot about who they are, how they live, and how they become leaders in the first place. Tell us about that. Okay, um, I guess... I think what I'd like to do, let me, let me talk a little bit about leadership and one of the ideas that I think within the Jesuit tradition would be uh, important. Um, and maybe to do that, how, what if we did a little experiment? Let's say, let, let's say if we took 15 quiet seconds now and everybody think of the names of one or two living people you would consider to be leaders. And why do you think of those names? So think about the qualities or attributes that you associate with being a good leader. And let's just take 10 quiet seconds and think about that, and then I'm going to talk. Okay, now I don't know what kinds of names are going through people's minds. But I would bet that the kinds of names that would be going through a lot of minds would be, I don't know, maybe Nelson Mandela, uh, Dalai Lama, probably political leaders here, uh, sports leaders, um, Richie McCaw, <laughs> you know, whoever it may be, right? Um, and this is, no this is our normal stereotype. So when I use the word leadership, we tend to associate leadership with being in charge. So we would think about generals, presidents, chief executives, bishops, people who are incredibly influential, people who have a lot of money. But this is just the natural stereotype. And I suspect nobody was thinking of their own name. You know? Um, and we don't think of our own names for some good reasons, because we believe modesty and humility are important virtues, and so, and, and we think, oh, you know, leadership is about uh, being uh, a boss and being powerful and being on top and all these sorts of things. So of course we wouldn't associate ourselves with that. But that, to me, is actually an incorrect stereotype of what does it mean to lead. Because if you look in a dictionary, of course you would find some definitions of leadership that refer to managing lots of people and so on. But you would also find this definition to point out a way, direction, or goal, and to influence others toward it. Okay, and look, everybody is doing those words all the time. Right, you know, I mean, you're pointing out a way by virtue of um, uh, how you treat people who come into your office, 
uh, who you hire. Um, a lot of people here, I guess, are parents. Could there be any more obvious example of pointing out a way and influencing others than what parents would do for children? You know, so by the dictionary definition, good parenting is good leadership. And I would say in some ways, part of the drama of what you would be trying to do in your different works is, uh, I, I, you probably don't think of it this way yourself, but I would say, is to help empower people to grasp for the first time or grasp again their leadership opportunity, you know, despite whatever uh, stigma, self-imposed or society-imposed difficulties or struggles or barriers they're dealing with, you know, to help them to appreciate, look, I have some opportunity to role model certain values and point out a way in my life. So now, how does this come back to the Jesuits that, you know, in corporate life and in, in, in civic life generally, we only have this very uh, stereotypical, hierarchical idea of leadership, you know? And one of the things that is true about Jesuit uh, training, which was really interesting to me, is that everybody receives the same training. You know, in the corporate world, what we do is we anoint you. We say, oh, look, we look like you're going to be a, a real goer here. And so we nominate you to be in some special track, and you're going to get training, and you, we don't see that in you. And so, sorry, pal, you know, you just keep laboring at the coal mines, and, you know, we're going uh, to do our best to make you feel pretty humiliated about who you are <laughs> for all the time that you're here, and we're going to do our best to make you feel special, and, and so on. And, you know, the Jesuit formation is not like that. They, you know, their formation are these spiritual exercises, and everybody goes through those. And I, maybe I should talk about that for 30 seconds, what they are? Okay, so these spiritual exercises in, were, I would, the way, the way I would say, they're, they're like a series of meditations uh, that, that um, you could, you might do over the course of a month, or you might do them, uh, you know, once a week over the course of a year, or something like that. And the way, and they, and they were written by the founder of the Jesuits, Saint Ignatius, and um, they're explicitly Christian. You know, they're they're guiding people to think about Jesus' life and what Jesus' uh, way, what his example was, and kind of helping people or challenging people to figure out how to uh, follow Jesus in the concrete circumstances of their own life. But what's also going on, it seems to me, is that they're making people think about, you know, look, who the heck are you? And what's important in a human lifetime? And what do you stand for? What do you, do all these kinds of things. So to me, they're really a very deep exercise in becoming self-aware in figuring out, pardon my language, who the hell you are and what you care about and all this kind of stuff. And to me, that is really the core, the first core um, uh, quality of people who are leading well. You know, in other words, they have some sense of who the heck I am and what am I about. If, if leadership by the dictionary is pointing out a way and influencing others, then really the first step is, you know what is the way that you want to point out. You know, and a lot of people, are they're kind of rolling through life and they never thought about these kinds of things. So the first task of, of uh, uh, kind of seizing one's own leadership potential, I think, is kind of understanding, okay, look, this is who I am. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm bad at. This is what my life has taught me. This is why I think we're here. This is how I think you ought to treat other people. And this is what I'm going to standpoint. That's a real leadership uh, mentality when people start to operate that way. So you're really, talk you're really talking about something profoundly different. We're really redefining leadership, aren't we? And really redefining um, how leaders are formed. And you talked about a few differences. I was interested in your book where you, you said um, we're all leaders and we're leading all the time, either well or poorly. Leadership springs from within. It's, as, it's um, as much about who I am as what I do. It's not an act, it's a way of living. And it's a slow, slow task of formation. Tell us about that. Um, okay, so yes, I am trying to, I was trying to articulate. I mean, look, these are not my ideas. That's the first thing to say is these are not my ideas. You know, like if I thought I had the great answers about leadership, I would have written a book about 
myself, you know, not about the Jesuits. So I'm trying to interpret a, a, a tradition as I understand it, right? And so, yes, I do feel like um, in interpreting that tradition, I'm trying to articulate um, ways of thinking about leadership and an approach that's very different from what we usually uh, get. So, for example, often the way leadership, people get trained in leadership and the way leadership is, is presented is, um, it is an act, actually. You know, it's about, I am learning, uh, I am learning tactics and techniques that will help me to manipulate you into doing what I want you to do, you know? Or, I mean, that's what a lot of leadership training passes for nowadays, you know? Or it's about learning how do I make presentations of myself, either in the ways I speak, the things I do, the ways I organize a group, that will, um, that will make clear my authority and power over everybody else in the group, you know? Uh, so it's kind of, uh, so, it, so it's sort of an act, you know? It's not about who I am, it's about turning myself into, uh, you know, somebody who's a successful manipulator or something like that, you know? And, well, I don't know about Australia. In the United States, this is basically what we have. It's very um, demoralizing because, part of my language, you know, basically a lot of what passes for public authority and formal leadership in companies and so on, levels of trust in the United States, you know, about 19% of people or less uh, say that um, they trust or um, have confidence in people who are in our Congress, and even few, even less than that, uh, say that they trust or believe people who are in positions of corporate leadership. And when they survey people, only um, I think 40% of people say that they trust their own manager. You know, so we have this terrible. Uh, we're, you know, we're caught in this terrible thing where we have this stereotype of leadership that is just so uh, uh, demoralizing and makes us all cynical and, and so on. So yes, I um, kind of introduced, um, as I understand the tradition, a completely opposite idea. You know, saying, no, 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 it's not about, um, it's not about putting on some act in order to intimidate or manipulate people. It's about understanding who you are and uh, what you stand for, and in some ways um, winning the confidence or respect of people for that point of view so that they want to be on your team. The, you know, the military, to me, the military services in the United States, we all have our ambiguous feelings about the role military plays, yeah? But, but to me, there's also a lot of great insight into leadership because that's what, what they do. And in the United States, uh, the definition of leadership within the armed services is uh, directing and influencing people in such a way that will win their obedience and respect and commitment. So to me, that's very insightful. You know, we all associate the military, at least in the United States, with this very hierarchical, I'm the general, you're the private, I tell you what to do. But the military understands that's not leadership. You know, leadership is that I treat you in such a way that you want to be on the team, you know? Or I talk about uh, what I believe in or what we believe in in such a way that you feel, yes, I am with that, you know? I want to be with that program and, and so on. And I have a way of operating that makes you feel invited, you know, that makes you feel, yeah, you know, this guy is making me feel like I have real value to offer here, and I, I'm uh, enthused about that, and I want to do that. So, yes, I, I sort of, um, uh, you know, try to present almost an, a diametrically different idea about leadership, and yes, that is something that's a process. We all think that leadership is a, uh, uh, is a destination. You know, so in other words, I'm the boss of Jesuit social services, I've arrived, I'm a leader. You know, or I'm, I'm president of the United States, I'm a leader. Say, no, I'm sorry. You're boss of Jesuit social services, you're Barack Obama, that's your platform for leadership. You know, the kind of leadership 
leadership is how well you use that platform. Whether you're president or whether you're the receptionist. You have a platform of leadership, what are you going to do with it? It uh, feels like there's a lot of responsibility in that, Chris, for a lot more of us. Um, because, you know, with that kind of leadership comes that you know, deep personal sense of, um, you know, how do I contribute through my life? Do I want to do this? Do I realise I'm a leader? But I want to move now into thinking about and exploring a bit the four key pillars that you identified were fundamental to underpinning Jesuit leadership. Self-awareness, which you started to talk a little bit about, ingenuity, love and heroism. How do these come together to form a really impactful leadership model that's relevant today to each one of us here? Let me uh, start just by defining those, and then, um, and then maybe you. I would leave it to you to we come back to one or another if, if you want to or not. Um, if people are still awake or not. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that what I tried to do in the book was take the early stories and history of the Jesuits and try to figure out. Uh, look, are there some qualities that? Um, that I could identify that helped account for why they were successful, you know, what they accomplished. And so I, I came up with four ideas that people who are leading well, uh, for one thing, they're self-aware. I spoke about that a bit, right? In other words, you know yourself, you, you, you understand your strengths and weaknesses, you've articulated what your values are, there's what I stand for, you have some kind of an outlook on the world, and, and so on, right? So that's one idea. Second idea is that people who are leading well, they're in, ingenious. And by ingenious, I mean this, that the world is going to keep changing, you know? And only people who are willing and open to keep adapting uh, are, are, are leading well. You know, and a lot of times when you're in organizations, you find people that uh, just the, the crazy maelstrom of a world that we're living in uh, it just totally intimidates them and they're unable to keep it, you know, they're just, they just want everything to be the way everything is, you know, and why do we have to change and this is the way I always did it, and why do we have to do it a different way and uh, I just want it to be more stable and so on and okay, look, that's what I want too and maybe the 22nd century will be like that but the 21st won't, you know, so the second aspect is people who are just accepting the reality of change and able to adapt. And the third idea I spoke about was uh, heroism. Heroism meaning that you motivate yourself with real um, uh, desire for excellence and with real ambition, uh, but most importantly with uh, goals that are bigger than any one person's ego. You know? Um, and I might want to come back to that if you let me. And finally, love. The idea that people who are leading well, they treat other people in a way that respects their dignity and tries to unlock their human potential. So in other words, they're not, we are appreciating people are not tools or animals. I'm not going to treat people like a tool or an animal, but I appreciate, okay, this person has some real potential and part of my job as a leader is to help this person understand her potential and do something with it. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm sorry, I'm not leading well. And a lot of times you see people, they're not doing that. You know, their attitude toward the people who work, so this is my team here, and my attitude toward them is not, uh, how do I um, uh, find and unlock and develop the potential in these people so they can do the best job they can. Rather, their attitude is, how can I use these people like tools so that I look good and I get ahead? You know, exactly the opposite. So those four, so the, uh, those four ideas that people who are leading well, they're self-aware, they're ingenious, they're change open, they're heroic, they care about something bigger than themselves, and, and they're loving. They treat other people in a way that um, respects and develops their potential. I was um, interested when you, when you talked about goals bigger than yourself, and one of the things it seems is that in order to lead, and one of the compelling things for the Jesuits from earliest times was there was a really big, compelling vision, you know, something that lifted them 
above themselves. And I want to move now to your book, Heroic Li Living, because it seems that in heroic leadership you talk about this model and you go into great detail, and I hope there's a whole lot of copies here. I hope some people buy them. You talk about the interrelatedness of those four pillars. In heroic li living, you really talk about what does it mean for me? How do I apply this to my daily life? How do I form a vision, you know, that is compelling enough to lift me out of my comfort zone, you know, to lift me beyond myself? And uh, I love the fact that at the beginning of Heroic Living, you open with the words, you were born to change the world. And you talk about the greatness that we're called to as human beings. And you talk about that civilization of love that we started with. Tell us what you think we're all being called to or invited to in that regard at this time in history. Um, okay, maybe, maybe I could come out that, uh, at that a kind of a roundabout way um, because I think I want to make a comment about what I think your different ministries or works and so on all do that's related to uh, uh, leadership and uh, and so on. And I guess here's, and, and if I will eventually come to the question you asked me. So here, you know, I mentioned that one of the, you know, one of the qualities of people who are leading well in organizations that are successful is that they're somehow heroic. It's about something bigger than yourself, okay? And I think this is, and um, I want to talk about that both with respect to within your organizations and I would say some of the values your organizations have in broader society. So first within your uh, organizations, let me tell this little story. You, you remember from your history books, I was actually alive <laughs> in the early 1960s when the Ru Russia and the United States are, are trying to get a rocket to the moon first, you know? And there's this anecdote that President Kennedy goes to the space agency, you know, to, I guess, boost morale or something. And at a certain moment, he runs into a janitor, and he asks the guy, uh, you know, I guess to be polite, just make conversation. He says, so what's your job here, you know? And the, jan and the janitor says to him, uh, Mr. President, I'm putting a man on the moon. Okay, I'm from New York City. We don't want any part of this team spirit nonsense, you know? Um, it's all about us. But look, I know, and everybody here knows, that the teams that perform best are teams where people, if I could use some American slang, get over themselves and appreciate, I'm sorry, it's not all about you. It's not all about being the finance person. It's not all about being the counselor. It's not all about being the... Uh, director in charge, whatever the heck the thing is, you know, but no organization does well unless people appreciate, are willing to appreciate, I'm part of something bigger than myself here, you know, like, and somehow I buy into the mission of Jesuit social services or my own piece of it, um, and I am willing to show up every day and invest some part of my ego and energy and time into something that I consider worthy, you know. And if you can have enough people operating that way within your counseling center, within your support area, with, you know, within your refugee support group, within your uh, prisoner transition group, asylum seeker, whatever the heck are you doing, if you have enough people thinking that way, you're going to do well. If you don't have a lot of people thinking that way, it's going to be a mess and you're wasting your time, you know? And, um, and Here's the, ne the next place I want to extend it, that really this century is not about that. This century is about taking care of yourself, at least in the United States. You know, it's all about me. How can I make as much money as I can? How can I have as much power as I can? How can I uh, look good, have the best looking clothes, have the best status, whatever the heck it may be, right? And I think that beyond Beyond the value you people feel that you're adding for the people you work with, the prisoners, the asylum seekers, those who are disturbed, whatever the group may be, 
beyond the value you think you're adding to them, I think that organizations like yours add an important value in the broader culture because you're kind of giving witness, by definition, to this idea that it's not all about you. You understand what I'm saying? Like the purposes of your, you know, I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that people who do what you're doing are not drawn to it by saying, oh wow, you know, here's, here's work where I can really get rich and famous and so on, right? I mean, people by definition are coming to this work I exactly for other reasons. You know, we're kind of giving witness to the fact that, no, I'm sorry, it's not all about me. And so, you know, just by existing, you're saying to politicians and to people who work at Westpac and JP Morgan and BHP Billiton and so on. Now, I think companies, I've worked in companies for many years, add great social value to society, and we could probably have a big debate about that, some of us, yeah? But it's also true that within companies you get a lot of very self-interested people and the same in politics. So uh, I think that this whole concept of purpose bigger than self, caring about something bigger than self is a real important value within an organization, but organizations that are, that are enshrined around that, that that's part of their mission, they add real value to uh, society at large, you know? And the first, I, in, in now, you, um, she's thinking, well, when is he actually gonna get around the question I asked him? <laughs> so you asked about heroic living, and the first part of heroic living is, is you know, you have to think about, uh, look, why am I here? What am I here for? What do I stand for? What's really important, you know? One of the things that we see in big companies is that when I started in J.P. Morgan in the 1980s, we didn't have a mission statement, and we didn't have corporate values. And I think because we didn't need them, because the world was uh, coherent enough and slowly moving enough that we all kind of took it from, when I started J.P. Morgan, uh, most people had been there 15 years, and so we had a very strong culture. We all had a, a shared sense of what business we were in and what we were doing. And then in the course of the 80s and 90s, the world became the maelstrom that it is now. You know, We're changing very quickly. People are coming in and out of the organization. People are bringing different religious beliefs, different cultural beliefs. Um, and so it became important for us as a company to articulate for ourselves Look, this is what we're here for, and this is what we're about, and to disseminate that. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? And I think that the part of the first part of heroic living is saying, aha, you know something? Individuals need to do that as well. But mostly we haven't got around to that. We haven't caught on to that. And so we have to do something that, that companies understand, understood they have to do in rapidly changing environments. You know, in other words, I have to get clear to myself who I am and what I'm here for and what I'm about and, and, and so on. It, um, it could be easy in the light of that for us to sit and say, wow, we're part of an organisation that's making a contribution to society, we're bearing witness to a whole different set of values just by the fact that we're here. What I'm interested in is what about those of us, and I think there are lots of us here, who could actually move to the next level in our own leadership, you know, the next level in our own sort of mobilising of our own capacity within this broader vision. Tell us about what people might do to that and what some of the tools in this tradition might be to help. Okay, you ask about tools, uh, so let me... Uh... Let me just talk about one, one tool, very simple. Anybody here could begin doing tomorrow. I think it's very powerful. Um, you know, most of our discussion is and will be uh, a kind of a think tank. You know, we're kind of thinking about what's leadership and why am I here and all these kind of big pictures. And I know when people uh, come to uh, an event or a meeting or a seminar, often their feeling is, I want a takeaway. What's the practical takeaway? What's the tip? You know? So now here's the only practical takeaway in the whole thing. You know, mostly this I think is about thinking and, and how we think of our lives, but okay, so we want a takeaway, a tip. So this would be that motion of 
program, so now you can pay attention and you know, fall, uh, take a nap again. So, you know, the, the Jesuits, uh, St. Ignatius uh, teaches Jesuits that every day they need to take a couple of little mental pit stops. Uh, so, for example, after lunch, I have a few minutes before I go back to my work, and, um, and then at the end of the workday, I'm commuting home, I'm going home on the tram, or however I go home in my car, and he says, uh, you need to uh, take, let's say, five minutes, and you need to do three things. Uh, one, you need to uh, remind yourself why you're grateful as a human being. And he says, then you also have to call to mind some uh, objective or issue or something that's really important for you or for your organization these days. So I don't know what, I reminded myself of the new year that I wanted to become a uh, less angry person or to become irritated less. So let me bring that to mind now. Uh, or uh, in our organization, it's really important to us uh, to get more efficient or something like that. So how are we doing? I'm gonna remind myself of that every day. And then, the third, so be grateful, remind yourself of some important objective or issue, and then third, mentally go back and relive the last few hours and try to take away some little lesson that might help in the next few hours. Just that simple. So, um, so for example, um, I was irritated all morning. What was going on? You know, what was going on there? You know, I, I, this is very normal for human beings. You know, often you kind of wake up at three in the afternoon and you realize I've been angry all day, and what I was what what I was angry about was something that happened at eight thirty in the morning that's now long past, but it sort of stays with me. You know, so in a way, his insight is no. You know, we need to relive these things and understand what was going on in my life, and can I put that behind me and now move on? Okay, or. If we're religious people, the way we might do that is let me go back through the last few hours and uh, try to think about how God was present to me or trying to be present to me in the people who came into my office, the problems that they were presenting to me, the experiences I had, and, and what was, you know, how was God trying to touch me and what does that mean for me, okay? I, I guess there are... Um, uh, probably people here who work with alcoholics uh, in, in your work, right? And you know this great, uh, the great wisdom of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? The, the, um, uh, the motto of Alcoholics Anonymous is one day at a time, right? So the idea is that we want to try to do something very ambitious. Stop drinking for the rest of your life. Or stop abusing for the rest of your life. Or stop debting for the rest of your life. But the, the great genius of that, the intuitive genius of that model is that it appreciates, okay, look, I can't say to you, stop drinking for the rest of your life and now go off and do it because you're gonna go home tonight and say, oh my God, I need a drink. How am I gonna manage that, right? But maybe I could say to you, okay, could you make it for the rest of today without drinking if we gave you a little support? And you say, yeah, I can do that. So this is the same insight. You know, the idea that I have to break life into smaller, more bite-sized segments that I can manage, you know? And I think the genius of this very simple uh, five-minute breaks a couple times a day, I think it's very uh, obvious when we think about the uh, lives that we're all trying to lead, you know, we're kind of floating along on a river of email and text and meeting and phone call, distraction, emergency, and uh, I get to the end of the day, I didn't even get to my number one priority, you know, I'm just sort of floating along here. And instead, this is giving us a chance to step back and take more control about where we want to go and what we're about today and these kinds of things, you know? Let me tell one more anecdote about this little process, about why I think it's very powerful. I read an interview once with um, the chairman of uh, one of the big, the Qantas in the United States, not Qantas, but you know, one of the big airlines in the United States. And this guy told this story about himself that he said, you know, when I first took over my job as chief executive, got promoted to that, he said, the way I lived my life, my work life, was the way we all, with the way I'm sure 90% of the people in this room live your lives. I come into work, I had a yellow pad, and I had listed on it the things I had to do. Okay? And then, my day was mostly meetings and 
emails and phone calls, all this kind of stuff. And then I would come to my desk at the end of this very busy day. I would look at the yellow pad, cross some things off, read my emails, write some things on, listen to my phone, add some things on. And he said, after about three months, I realized that my whole life was just responding to the exigencies, the needs of everybody else. And maybe not even what was their priorities, but just what was on their mind right now. You know, I need this piece of information, let me call, what's your name? Okay, let me call and see, you know, maybe she can give me this piece of information. So he said, I realized that, you know, I had to somehow turn my life completely around. And so then what I started to do was, I came to work each day and every morning I wrote down, what are the three most important things I could do today? You know, for my job, what do I have to do today? And then all these other things, they have to be secondary. I do them as I can. So this little mental uh, exercise that I, that I just described, let me take five minutes, a couple of times each day, it's sort of indirectly helping to accomplish the same point of this anecdote I just stored. You know, it's helping to refocus us on what's important here, what am I really about. And I think that that's um, a very appropriate moment for us to thank you, Christopher, and to do just that at our tables for those of you who've been at uh, Just Leadership Breakfast before, you'll know that we always stop at a point at the end of our conversation and ask all of us just to be quiet for a couple of minutes and just reflect on what's touched me, what's moved me, what's, what's the takeout for me in here, what's trying to be, to, um, what, what's trying to be told to me almost, you know, in what I've heard. So we'll do that for a couple of minutes and then I'll introduce um, the opportunity to have a conversation at the tables. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor.